All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you all for coming to our first lunchtime talk after spring break. We have a couple more good ones coming up the rest of this semester. Dr. Astalis will be giving a presentation, I think April 11th, on something astronomy or space related. I don't quite have a title yet, but it will be forthcoming and announced soon. It is my uh, pleasure to introduce our speakers today. We have four student speakers. These are all um, Porter scholars. Many of you know that William Porter, has, uh, an alumnus from Adams State, has made a couple of uh, significant donations to the college, and one of those was to support scholarships in science and math. And we have this Porter Scholars Program, which provides not only tuition scholarships to students based upon their academic achievement and uh, financial need, but also some, if they are for Porter scholars can apply for what we call focused academic programs. And these are sort of individualized academic uh, studies. Some of them are research. You may have attended a talk this past fall on some travel to Africa that was in uh, a couple of our Porter scholars had taken the previous summer. <laughs> Today's talk, uh, we have two groups of students, uh, two biology students and two earth science students. Um, we'll get, be giving presentations on some of the research that they've been doing over the past year that is uh, funded in part by the Porter Scholars Program. So, the first two students I'm going to introduce are Amber Harlan and Josh Machoni. And then this afternoon, or just after them, in about 20 minutes or so, we have Dan Carver and Gary Potter. So, please welcome them. We'll get started. all the questions until the very end, just to make sure that both groups have ample time here. We'll try to have a few moments at the end for some questions. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, Amber and myself, over the summer, we're examining a 5S, B5S rRNA IGS region in Pythium, and it was mentored by Dr. James Bedard. So we'll get right into it. We're going to do a brief summary of what we were, our initial approach was, and then some of the problems that we got into and then where we're at currently. So our main objective was to isolate and sequence this five to eight kilobase intergenic spacer region, which is uh, IGS. Next, we wanted to use PCR, which we'll get into in a second, to amplify the spacer region in order for us to sequence it and do other experiments with it. Notice that it is not as easy as it seems. Hopefully whenever I give you the explanation you'll be able to just say, oh, pretty simple. Put in practice, it can be quite a difficult process. So next what we wanted to do was then isolate that DNA region and then transfer it into a vector in bacteria. And finally, sequence and then analyze that sequence and go from there. So a little background information about what we're working with. Pythium is a genus that belongs to the kingdom Protista. It was originally in the kingdom Fungi, but recent molecular data uh, concluded that it was more closely related to organisms in Protista, so that's its current location. It's most extensively studied for this 5S rRNA gene diversity. And because of that, we're able to assess an evolutionary stability of that gene family in these organisms. Um, the functional 5S genes can be either linked to this rDNA repeat or found in tandem arrays elsewhere in the genome. So if we look at this figure up here, we're showing linked and non-inverted where there's a pseudogene in here with the large subunit, small subunit, and this 5.8 unit. Inverted just means it's on the other strand of DNA since DNA is double-stranded. And then unlinked in tandem, the pseudogene is not there. And whenever we say tandem, we're meaning this arrangement right here, large subunit, small subunit, 5.8 S unit, are being repeated over and over again sequentially in the genome. So what we did was we found groups of these species that were in this tandem array. And then from that, we found the ones that had this 5S pseudogene still present. And what our main objective was is we wanted to look at these pseudogenes to see if their sequence was similar or if they may have differed. So what constitutes a pseudogene is it was originally a functional gene that acquired some mutation to where now it's non-functional. And so once the gene is non-functional, there is no reason for the genome to maintain it. It's a waste of energy. You can think of it in that way. So it's going to keep on accumulating these mutations. So 
if something has a lot of mutation, you can infer that that pseudogene is older with respect to when it first became a pseudogene because it has not been maintained for that long in evolutionary time. So PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction. So what you have whenever you start is a long sequence of DNA and you want to isolate and amplify one specific region. So in this diagram, this region is what we want to amplify. So what you do is you design primers that anneal on either side or either strand of the, <coughs> excuse me, DNA. And what you do is denature the DNA so it becomes single-stranded, the primers bind, and then a polymerase extends it and replicates that section of DNA. And if you'll notice, it extends beyond the target, but whenever it binds in the second uh, cycle, it will bind to this region right here, extend, and because there's no more template DNA to work off of, now you have a specific size product length at the very end, and after a couple cycles, you get enough of this to where now you're getting an exponential increase. And in ours, we did 20 cycles, so uh, at the end of your PCR reaction, your reaction mixture contains the majority of this specific target sequence. So remember, not as easy in practice. So we were specifically wanting to isolate this 5 to 8 kilobase IGS region. And so for our PCR mixture, which is just the components that are normally added to it, there's a buffer system, deoxynucleotide triphosphates, which are the monomer units that are added whenever you're replicating the DNA strands. <coughs> a Q primer and P2 primer were just the specific <coughs> primers we were using to isolate that target sequence out of the, gene, the DNA. And then we had TAC polymerase, which is the enzyme that actually replicates during the PCR reaction. It's specifically TAC because it's heat stable. Uh, in the other, fi other figure, you'll notice that the temperature was 72 degrees Celsius, so some proteins will be nature at that temperature. This one, however, is heat stable, and that's why it's used in PCR. And then we have our template DNA and deionized water to bring up the PCR reaction volume to uh, the actual volume we want. So our initial PCR results were very promising. We do, on this gel here, see a product visible at about 5.5 kilobases according to this DNA ladder, which we know the actual sizes of all of these bands here. So I have labels here that this is about 5 kilobases, so a little higher, so about 5.5 kilobases. Uh, the product's not in a very high concentration. This is more the concentration we want to see. The brighter the band is, the more concentrated. So we decided that we needed to do uh, change the mixture a little bit to try and get a higher concentration. And I should also note, 5.5 kilobases for a PCR reaction is not a size that you normally work with. So it just by itself has inherent troubles that you deal with uh, just because of the absolute size. So what we decided to do was use a solution called DMSO, which stands for dimethyl sulfoxide. And it's believed that it decreases secondary structures. So the DNA is so long, and if you think of this linear strand of DNA, it has a tendency to coil on itself at times. So those supercoils, whenever the polymerase gets to that supercoil, it hits it and stops replication. So you don't get a full length product. So we believe by using this DMSO, we could at least uh, get rid of most of them, if not all, so that we can get more full-length products. And we do have high concentrations, and there's actually a pretty good band here for Pythium and Andrum, but the rest of our samples are all smears, so not what you want to see whenever you're doing a PCR reaction because you need a specific size of DNA to work with, and when you have a smear, you can't uh, excise a specific size of DNA, you'll be getting more of a range, which is not favorable. So what we concluded was that we were going to increase the amount of template DNA to see if that might help, and we kept a 5% DMSO concentration, and that was also not successful. So uh, you know, after a while, we did some more tests, and 
after a while, the most depressing thing of the whole summer was seeing gels that either had smears or there was absolutely nothing at all, because that means you have to pretty much start right back from square one and do the whole process over again. So where Amber's going to pick up is where we started doing some troubleshooting to figure out what was actually going on with our reaction mixture to see what was the problem. Okay, so as Josh said, uh, <coughs> nothing is working, so what are we going to do to try and fix it? Um, we decided that we, we tried a bunch of different options as he spoke about the DMSO and, and things of that sort, but uh, we decided to go back to the basics. Maybe one of our reagents may be the cause. And so the first step that we did is we uh, stained the genomic DNA to ensure its viability. And it was viable. Um, so we made new stocks. And that's shown in this gel right here. Uh, the next step was to test the ultra pure water. Now, ultra pure water, it doesn't have ions, it doesn't have any kind of thing that could contaminate the um, overall reaction mixture and cause us to um, not be able to obtain the results we were hoping for. So, uh, it there is no, there are no bands on this uh, gel, which, as he said before, is really depressing. But what we do know is that we use different water, different ultra pure water, and there's still no bands. So we know that okay, well, it's not the ultra pure water uh, being contaminated. We went ahead and ran the primers to ensure their viability, um, and you can see them. It's kind of hard to see, but. Uh, they're down here. They're, they're smaller in size, so they'll run further on the gel. So they were showing up. Um, and so what we decided to do is we, we got a new TAC polymerase. Um, as he said, they're heat stable, but you do need to keep them um, frozen and, and in certain temperatures when you store them. And so what we concluded is maybe somehow our TAC polymerase had become denatured or something had gone wrong with it. Uh, we went ahead and used new DNTP mix because we ran out of the previous DNTP mix with all of the gels that we were running. So, and then, of course, we used the primers and the, and the buffers. And what we found was that both PCR reactions worked. So, yay, finally, we found something to work. And uh, this was the happiest gel of the summer. So uh, <laughs> we uh, can see that both species um, of Pythium did go ahead and give us the bands in the uh, around the 5.5 to 8 kilobase region that we were we were hoping for. So, dang tack. <laughs> um, and so now we can go back to what we were originally trying to do, and that was to amplify that region of DNA in the IGS um, section, and we were successful. So I just want to emphasize that because. We weren't successful for a long time. Uh, and we did obtain greater concentrations of the product. So you can see that um, for all the species, we obtained uh, quite, uh, quite uh, great amounts and great concentrations of the product. So the next step was to purify these products. And uh, <coughs> the way you do that is you take the gel um, and you obviously, we've, we've already gotten to this step right here. We've already run the gel. So you want to isolate the band, so you excise the band from the gel. And then you use some kind of um, a kit that will help you to kind of extract that DNA from that gel. Um, and so what we used was the Topo XL PCR cloning kit. Uh, and it kind of has a basic step-by-step -step process. So uh, you prepare the gel slide, uh, you add it to this mini column assembly, centrifuge, wash, and then you know, you'll loop the DNA. Now that's a very basic step-by-step -step process. It's a little more involved than that, but um, that's just kind of the basics of what we did. And so the next step is to ligate it into a vector and go ahead and transform into a bacterial, um, a bacterium. And the bacteria we chose to use was E. coli. Uh, so I kind of thought I'd give you a little idea of what do I mean by a vector and what do I mean by transforming it into E. coli. Um, it's not like we're turning it into bacteria or anything. So uh, the features, there's three main features of a vector that you want to consider. And the first is its origin of replication. And this kind of allows replication within the bacterial host. Uh, so we used the PCRXL Topo, um, you know, copyright Topo uh, vector. And uh, there, its origin of replication is right here. 
So again, it just allows the bacteria to go ahead and replicate this section of DNA when it replicates, um, when it replicates its own DNA. <clears throat> the next is a selectable marker, and this allows only bacterial colonies that have uptake, uh, well, have taken up the uh, plasmid to grow. So we need only bacteria that are going to contain this vector. We don't want a bunch of bacteria that don't have it. So how are we going to ensure that all of, I mean, it's not like you can go with a microscope and pick out you know, bacteria. Uh, so how are we going to ensure that this vector is in all of our bacteria? And that's done with these um, antibiotic resistant genes. So here we see kenamycin and zeosin. So when you make your media for your plate, you go ahead and incorporate the antibiotic into it. And by doing that, when you go ahead and you plate your, uh, or culture your bacteria, those that aren't resistant to those antibiotics will die. So. And finally, you have a multiple cloning region. And that's the section of the vector that you're going to insert your DNA into. And so, uh, there's different ways of making sure how do you know which ones have recombinant plasmids, as we call them, or those that have the, the DNA inserted into them, or those that don't. And so with our specific uh, vector, what we, what's important to know is the CCDB um, gene. This gene is uh, responsible for producing a cytotoxic protein. So if we do have a recombinant, it will change the reading frame the DNA will insert itself and change the reading frame for that gene. And so that gene will not create a functional product. So you won't get a, a toxic protein. But if there is no um, DNA in that section, then the protein will be produced and the cell will die. And then we go ahead and we wanted to transform it into E. coli. And that just means the bacteria is going to uptake it into itself, this, this vector that we went ahead and ligated with our DNA. And so it's kind of shown right here in, our, uh, in the bacterium. And then you will have the bacteria grow, and now you have tons and tons of copies of that one section of DNA that you wanted to uh, create large uh, amounts of. So that's kind of shown down here. And so we needed to verify that we had the, the DNA that we wanted um, from those colonies. And so we went ahead and you know, uh, isolated a colony from our, our plates. We ran PCR and we ran a gel, and this is the results of that gel. So if you look right here, this is the product that we were hoping to get, that isolated IGS region that's been replicated in the vector. Uh, now you might ask, well, what are these bands down here and what are these bands up here? Well, Josh mentioned supercoiling and uh, Bat DNA will run differently on a gel according to its shape. And so the supercoiled uh, bacteria, or excuse me, DNA will be more compact and so they'll run further on the gel. So that, are, that would be represented by those um, bands. And then uh, the linear form of the DNA will run, won't run as far. And so that, that is represented by those bands. Uh, but we were able to get uh, colonies that had the, the DNA that we wanted to sequence and uh, everything was, was working out well and those are represented here in lane 4 with P. mammalotum and then um, in lane 9 with P. macrosporum negative. And so then you take this DNA that you've isolated and you send it off um, to a facility and they go ahead and they sequence it for you. And I'm not going to go into all of the how you sequence and, and do all of that. But what you want to know is that you know you have um, four different nucleotides for your DNA. You know, you have your uh, adenine and, and all, of, all of those. And Josh mentioned them earlier. But what you, you'll see is that they're represented by different colors of peaks. And so uh, when they're ran through, the computer will, realize, will kind of know what color is flashing by. And so that will tell it, oh, okay, so uh, we have an A here, or we have a T here. And then it'll read out like this, and you'll be able to identify, um, okay, so yes, we did have an A, and we did have a G, and it's, it's identified by the, the large peak that flashes up. Now, this kind of looks really compacted together. Um, this is a, a large section of DNA. You can take this 
program and you can spread it out and it's a lot easier to read and the peaks are much more clear. But this is the way we can sequence um, that section of DNA that we were trying to figure out the structure of. Because if you remember, we're trying to infer an evolutionary trajectory or, or relationship, a phylogenetic tree, based on pseudogene accumulation and mutation. So we need to know what that looks like. And how, what we, we need to know what the original looked like. So obtaining the sequence is essential, basically. So that's as far as we got this summer. <laughs> um, you know, we had, I, 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 I told Josh, uh, well, we got a first glimpse into how much you fail in research. <laughs> so, I mean, that's, that, I, I see that as a good thing. Um, but we were successful in obtaining sequence, and so to continue the project, um, you know, we need to sequence the rest of the species and then uh, go ahead and start analyzing that uh, DNA structure. So we would like to thank the Porter Scholars Program for the funding and support of this project, and I'd like to thank every one of you for coming today. And you'll ha you can ask us questions at the end. So. Now that the pizza's gone, this tends to go a little slower, so hope you can all stay with us. Uh, but Gary and I are Porter Scholars, and we did receive money for doing just this, uh, determining the age of dirt, uh, <laughs> numerically. <laughs> so what this talk is about, instead of going over the details of what our individual projects are, we're going to try to look at how you can relatively age date material in earth science as well as numerically age dated, and then apply that to what we did in our own projects. So uh, this is just a, a little tough to see here, but you can see there's a band of charcoal, and this will come into play as long, along with this individual as well. So to get things started, uh, we're geographers, so you start with the map, and that's pretty much how it goes. But so this is our study area. We have, um, we're looking at the Conejos River, or Lahara Creek, Hot Creek, Alamosa River, we have different localities on these. These are just areas of defined soils. Um, and this work started in the summer 2009. I've been working with Dr. Beaton on it since then. And so far we've described 21 soil profiles, um, analyzed them in the lab and mapped them all. So it's compiling to be a whole lot of information and getting harder and harder to work with. <laughs> so as far as an outline of what we're doing, uh, Gary's gonna talk to you a little bit about what is a soil. and so this is a soils project, so you should know a little bit about it. Um, I'm going to bring up what I defined as the fundamental questions of earth science. I kind of, I think it's important and it kind of describes what we're doing a lot in this project. Uh, and then the almost laws of earth science. If you've ever talked to an earth scientist, you realize there's not many square answers. You get a lot of, it depends. So that's why they're almost laws. Um, our married man over here is going to talk about advanced dating techniques. <laughs> And then we're going to bring up, uh, relate this all back to our own project and how old is our dirt actually. And then kind of tying everything together is this idea of a prediction model. I um, mean, so we'll get to all these things. So, all right, I'll hand it over to Gary with what is the soil? Okay, so what is the soil? Soil incorporates what we consider the four spheres of um, earth science, the lithosphere, the hydrosphere, the biosphere, and the atmosphere. What I mean by that is soil is made up of mineral matter, um, organic matter, air, and water. So these uh, four different elements are um, determined in a soil by this acronym CLORT that we use, and this stands for climate, uh, organic material, relief, parent material, and time. So how this works is that uh, if you have two different soils and all of these factors are the same in those two soils, so they have the same climate, they have the same organic material, they have the same relief, they have the same parent material, and they, have, they were formed at the same time, then they are indeed the same soil. But if just one of these factors is different, then it's a different soil. So say you have a soil that has all the same climate, it has the 
same organic material, the same relief, the same pair material, but they were formed at two different times, then they are indeed two different soils. Uh, something important to note is that soil on a landscape is an indication of a, a stable landscape. So a landscape, or a landform, excuse me, that is either a grading or eroding cannot form a soil on it. So like the sand dunes, the sand's blowing away, you can't, a, a soil can't really form on it. And organic matter in a soil can be dated. So if you have a buildup of, enough buildup of organic material in a soil horizon, then that soil can be dated. So here's a couple of pictures. Um, so what we're talking about when we're talking about our, oh, what did I just do? <laughs> so <laughs> well, what we're talking about when we're talking about organic horizons is, are these dark black layers here. And these form on the surface um, when, a land, when a landform is stable. So then like here, here's a, was at one time a stable land surface and that's now been degraded on top of, and this surface can be dated. Let's turn it back over to Dan for what is fully asking earth science. Yeah, and so, and again, this is just my opinion, but I, I guess I've been at it for five years and I've considered that these questions keep coming up. And the first one is, what is that? You know, you're outside and you're looking around and you see a landform or something and you really have to define what it is. And this kind of encompasses what we do in describing or looking at a landform and taking notes on it, gathering data, all kind of falls into trying to figure out what that landform is. Uh, the next question, pretty obvious I think, is how did it get there? Uh, we deal a lot with this question, especially in our project, this is probably the majority of the time we spend, is dealing with the processes to figure out how that landform we see today managed to be there. And the third question is, how old is it? Uh, it? This can be a little bit more difficult to answer, depending on what you're working with. And, um, so what we're going to talk about next is a couple of these almost laws of earth science that deal with how you can figure out how old a object is. And first, we're going to just talk about relative um, age relationships. So which one's older than, is this older than this other medium next to it? So principle of superposition. Anyone who's taken a geology class should recognize this one pretty honestly. The basic idea of it is which one came here second. <laughs> right? And I'm trying to include modern analogs so you can understand these earth science principles. Um, this is actually, it was a parked car in England and a landscaping truck was taking a turn and it fell off the top of this truck. But the idea behind this principle of superposition is that the material on the top is the youngest. Uh, we see this and use it extensively in earth science. When soils, you can tell this orange material towards the bottom is older than the darker material on top of it. As well as in geology, we have two sandstone layers here. This white one is older than the red one on top of it. Really kind of straightforward, but important and easily applied for relative age dating. Uh, the next principle is uh, cross-cutting relationships. So this is a picture of a dog nose and a screen door. <laughs> so, basically what it's saying is that this medium was here, the screen was here in order for the dog to move through it. So the material intruding through an existing medium is younger. Uh, we see this again with soils and what we call crotovina. These are these small circular features here. These are animal burrows that were basically dug out hollow holes and then material from the top, the surface, falls into them. So you have this section of younger material that's held within an older medium. Uh, geology, very extensively used with um, faults, igneous intrusions, a lot of applications. This is probably the most important uh, principle for that um, study. Uh, cultural deposits. Okay, so let's say you're cleaning your room and you're looking under your bed and you find this box that you have and you have no idea what's in it. No idea how old it is, there's nothing on it, no labels. And then you open the box, and this is sitting right on top of it. <laughs> Jody Shepard's Jazzercise poster. Um, this is a cultural deposit that gives you identification of how old the material in that box is. So it can be said that items which are found in place and can be identified to belong to a specific culture can be used to determine um, the date the, from the medium it came from. So we do this a lot with archaeological artifacts. Uh, this is a point that we found in one of our areas, and it's, we sent the picture to an archaeologist, and they told us it was a Cumbres church, um, and used extensively by the Folsom culture. 
and they can be up to 10,000 years old. Uh, we found this point on a land surface, so it doesn't tell, them, tell us anything about the medium because it wasn't in place. But these are all kind of applications of relative age dating techniques, which we use quite a bit. Um, but by and far, what we do the most of is comparing soil horizons. So we look at a lot of different characteristics of the soils to try to figure out what the age of the soil is relative to the soil next to it. Um, so we're going to look at where the soil is on the landscape. What's that relationship to each other? The geomorphic position describes where that soil is in relation to the creek. Um, in this case, this is from our Hot Creek study area, both these soils are T2 soils. That means they're the second step up on the landscape. Um, we can look at soil profiles. These are the kind of ABCs of the soils um, and compare those. The color, uh, soil color tends to redden with uh, age, so that can give you an indication of how old the soil is. Structures develop with time, so again, a really good way to determine the time. Um, the boundaries of these horizons, how much organic matter is in each horizon, and texture, which is the percent sand, silt, and clay, all give you information to compare one another, these profiles against one another, to try to figure out, are they the same? Which one's older, which one's younger? Um, and as earth scientists, we graphically represent this stuff, um, either in a kind of a table form he over here or in a graph. So we can see these three-dimensional relationships. These are two-dimensional things. But, and we can see them right next to each other. It's easier to compare them. And this is really a lot of what our work has been, is gathering this information and presenting it in a way that we can make comparisons directly between soils. So, on to the interesting stuff. Okay, so I'm going to start by talking about some advanced dating techniques. Before we really get started, this is Dr. Hong Wang, and uh, he's from the Illinois State Geologic Survey. He's the guy we've been sending all of our samples to to date uh, over there. Um, very useful resource, uh, always happy to help. Um, we asked him if we could get a date off of a 0 0.15 gram piece of charcoal, and he replied with some confidence that I can get 10 AMS dates off of that. So I thought that was pretty cool. And then uh, just a little history, in 1992 you, couldn't, you could not get an AMS date off of a 1.5 gram piece of charcoal. So it just shows how far the technology has really come in the last 20 years. Uh, so collection methods. So how do we collect these, these uh, samples? Um, basically, it takes a lot of pre-planning and some careful collection methods. First of all, you have to figure out what you're going to date and why you're going to date it. Um, you can't just go out and just dig up some dirt and throw it in a bag and expect to get a date that means anything. So you have to look at these soil profiles and figure out what it is that's important to your research and why you want to date that. So in a lot of the case with Dan and I, it's kind of hard to see in this picture, it looks like. But there is a darker layer right here, and this is what's called a buried A horizon. Um, so basically, that's a lot of what we've dated so far. And it's a, an organic rich layer that tells us, uh, yeah, there, now you can see it. See how it's kind of this dark layer underneath here? So when you date that, it gives you a, a young a date that basically says that everything on top of it is younger than that. And that the, that sediment that started to aggregate after that soil, or after that soil was there, is at least that young. And also, um, Cultural deposits are commonly found in these buried age horizons because they were stable for a long period of time, and so it's, uh, it's uh, important to archaeologists. So how do we collect them? Basically, we go out there with a shovel and shovel it into a, a gallon-sized bag and take it back to the lab, and uh, the, really the big thing we can't, you can't have is modern roots. So we go through and with gloves and pick out all the modern roots out of the sample, um, and then you put this bulk sample in a bag and wrap it up and send it to Dr. Hong Wang, and he sends us a date bag. <laughs> Um, so then, also, what you might not be able to find um, organic rich material when you're trying to date something. So, for example, <laughs> this picture here, these are all just rocks. There's no organics anywhere in this. So how would you date that? So the way you go about that is finding an organic piece of material that was um, washed in there during the time that the sedimentation was taking place. And that's what this picture is showing. Here's a little tiny piece of charcoal that the ruler is supposed to be pointing to, but not really. Um, 
And so you can kind of tell that this little orangish layer, which is this here, is starting right here. So this is the very bottom of that fill. So when we, we collect this material, we date that, that tells us that everything above that is, that, you know, happened after this date. And the collection for that is basically the same. You go out and you, you know, very carefully pull that out of the cut bank there with, you know, a trowel generally and put it in a bag and be careful not to touch it and wrap it up in some tin foil and send it off. So radiocarbon dating. Um, some basic ideas of what radiocarbon dating is. It's basically a, a comparison of a ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12. Um, carbon-14 is a weakly radioactive isotope and carbon-12 is a stable isotope. So how this works is that um, when organisms are alive, they, uh, they accumulate carbon-12 and carbon-14 um, through the CO2 in the air. When an organism dies, the carbon-12 stays constant and the carbon-14 radioactively decays at a known rate. So by, telling, by looking at a sample and seeing how much radio carb or how much carbon-14 is left in the sample, you can get a, an, a numeric age data on approximately how old that is. So the ages of our dirt. So this is our Hot Creek locality. There's been a lot of work done here. And um, so this is the example Dan had a little bit earlier. These are both T2 surfaces. And we got two different dates. One is uh, 1,250 years old and one is about 3,000 years old. And what we had determined from our research, from looking at the particle size and the organic content and all of that from our, from our soils, is that these buried surfaces were continuous. So they had, they had very similar um, sediment size, they had very similar organics, they had similar structure. So we thought that this was basically a continuous land surface at one time, and then um, something happened, like climate change, for example, that would cause the whole landscape to degrade after that. But after getting these dates, they're not. They're, they're, so they have all four of the same, all four of those um, chlorp aspects except for time. So they were formed at two different times, so therefore they can't be the same two soils. So this one is our Alamosa River location. Right now we only have one date at uh, one th or 2,150 years old. And that's kind of right from this darkened layer right here, bottom band. And uh, so basically this is a huge terrace, as you can tell, it's like 12 feet tall. And um, we thought at one point that this orangish stuff down here it might be glacial outwash. And so we were hoping that we would get a date that would kind of fit in a timeline after that. But this is way too young. If it were glacial outwash, this would have to be, I mean, this material would have to be at least 12,000 years old. And this is only 1,200, or excuse me, 2,150 years old. So the other thing we're trying to do here is we're waiting on a date from another T1, which is this surface. So there the are two different terraces at two different times. And what you can tell by that is you can tell if you have relative ages of these landforms and you can tell when the river started to downcut and you can, get, you can infer something about the um, behavior of the river. This is our Lahara Creek locality. And uh, we, again, we have two dates that we thought were the same soil. And in this case, we think they probably still are. Um, but they're 300 years difference. Well, the reason that could be is that um, these, both these dates are from a cut bank that's on an alluvial fan. So what happens is you have the main feeder channel uh, of this river here is, is meandering through its river basin. And another channel is coming in and from the mountain slope and meeting up with this channel and um, depositing alluvium. So what happens is the high energy stream up here has all the sediment in it and as it comes to the flat area it loses all its energy and that sediment starts to fan out in all directions. So and that would build up over time. It would get a little farther out and a little further out. So what happened was is that this 900 year old date is toward the middle of the fan more and so it got buried at about 900 years ago. Once this, that soil gets buried, no more organic material is being deposited into that soil. Whereas this one might have been a little, is, is a little further out in the fan, and so it might not have been buried yet. So it might have taken 300 years for um, the fan to build out far enough to cover the soil. So at that time, during that 300 year period, more organic material was being deposited into that soil. And hand it over to Dan, to Dan for the, the prediction model. Yeah. 
Okay, so why, I mean, what, what are we gathering these dates for? I mean, that's really the question we haven't answered yet. And what that comes into place is the prediction model. Um, we're really trying to create a map of the landscape. And I'm going to hit the lights on you again, sorry. <laughs> but we're trying to produce maps of these landscapes, which are tough to see. Yeah. But uh, basically what it, we're saying is we're identifying landforms and their extent. And then we're also determining the age of these landforms. So if you're an archaeologist and you're looking for uh, cultural deposits of a specific age, you can say from our work that, well, we have this landform here that has a buried land surface of 1250 years before present. So cultures that were around at that time were likely to have dropped material on that land surface at that time. If you're looking for a culture that's substantially older than that, um, you won't have that much luck trying to find it in that spot. Uh, we also have another landform down here that's a little bit older, so you might have better luck looking for a different culture in this area of the specific creek. Um, areas that we don't have dates for, landforms we don't have dates for, uh, we can just say that they're not as old as the youngest date we have. Um, and again, that limits where you need to look for um, your archaeological material. And uh, for concluding remarks, uh, it's been a great experience to really get the funding and go through the process of dating these materials. Um, the carbon-14 dating is a huge part of quaternary science and um, numerical age dating in earth science. So, but what we learned is that these numerical ages are not answers. Uh, they don't, they give you a number and then you have to fit your work into that number now. Um, so they really kind of, they can create some complications in what your original thoughts were. And the number doesn't explain anything about the processes. Uh, we're still relying really heavy on those first two initial questions of you know, what is earth science, basically, to explain why we see this current landscape today and uh, why does it look in this manner that we see it today. Um, what they really allow for is the correlation of our work to other scientists in different regions and different studies. So since soils represent landscape stability, we can say that um, there's a specific climatic conditions that are affecting the soil at that time to produce that stability. So someone who's doing research on climate in the front range might be able to take our data, our numbers, and use that to enhance or affect what they're studying. So it really broadens the scope of the project to the greater community. With that, I'd like to say thank you. <laughs>
how long ago this started to fill. And that could possibly tell us that whether or not this is glacial or not, or it could be um, colluvial. It could just be a downward movement of rocks. Questions for us or for the other group? How, how much um, error, I guess, is there with carbon 14 dating? So, all the values we've gotten so far are plus or minus 70, 70, 70 years. years. Yeah. And those also are not calibrated. So, those are what they call radiocarbon years. And you can calibrate those based on the changes in carbon 14 of the atmosphere over time. questions. Thank you. Adams State College. Great stories begin here.